Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to the earnings conference call of EFC India Limited for Q2 FY25. We have with us today Mr. Umesh Shahe, Founder and Managing Director of EFC India Limited and Mr. Nikhil Bhuta, Whole Time Director of EFC India Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing the star then zero on your touchstone phone. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Nikhil Bhuta, whole time director to give his opening remarks and discuss further on Q2 FY25 performance. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I am Nikhil Bhutta, Director of EFC India Limited. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for joining our earning conference call today. We greatly value your ongoing interest and support in our company. In today's call, we will review our financial and operational first year September 2024. We will also highlight key strategic decisions made by our group and share our outlook going forward. For quarter two, EFC India Limited has achieved impressive financial results with consolidated revenue reaching approximately 171.08 crores and an EBITDA of around rupees 84 crores and PAT of rupees 36.56 crores. For half year ended 30th September 2020, we have impressive financial results with the consolidated revenue reaching approximately rupees 276.36 crores and an EBITDA of around rupees 133.59 crores and PAT of rupees 52.33 crores. This results underscore our resilience, strategic focus and the management's unwavering commitment to driving the company's growth. The rental breakdown reveals that the rental segment generated approximately rupees 89.20 crores, accounting for about 54% of our total revenue. In comparison, the BNB, the design and build business, contributed rupees 77.24 crores, representing approximately 46% of the total revenue till 30th September 2024. At EMC, uh, we create synergies through our dynamic workspaces under brand EMC, Sprint, and Bigbox. Additionally, we offer exquisite furniture through Ape Design Industries Limited and provide meticulous internet designing services on a turnkey basis under our company, White Hills Interior Limited. Starting from the managed office business sector, we have significantly enhanced our capacity in this quarter by increasing the leasehold area by around 175,000 square feet, adding over 3,600 seats across four centers in four existing cities. We have set a strong foothold in eight cities in India covering about 2.4 million square feet under management. We have now total 61 sites under our management across these eight cities in India. The total seat capacity has crossed 50,000 marks. In addition to the concluded transactions, BNB division has got an additional order book of more than 70 crores in the hand. One of the largest deal wins that the BNB has successfully secured during this quarter is a contract with the TCS of rupees 18 crore plus. In the furniture and furniture manufacturing division, we have successfully completed our first ever order post our accomplishment of commercial production 20th September. With the order book being strong and the furniture division is poised to achieve much better in the coming quarters. Sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, could you please come closer to the mic and speak? Sure. Uh, with this, I thank you all, and I now open the forum for question and answer session. See if you can please open the forum. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. 
anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchtone telephone. If you wish to withdraw yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. <coughs> The first question is from the line of Sahil Sharma from Columbus Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate the management. Uh, it's quite remarkable performance, like especially the board meeting for results was for five hours from you know 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. and then to attend the conference call at 9:30. It clearly shows your dedication to the business, and it's reflecting in the fantastic performance. In our, you know, best ever revenue and profits, and most importantly, the cash flows, which have really uh, improved in the first half. Yes, thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Sahil. Ah, uh, yes. So my first question is, so first of all, I wanted to understand the seasonality in the margins, just to understand why it is that our margins are typically the lowest in Q1 and then highest in H2, Q3, and Q4, and you know, uh, how is it tied to the business development cycle uh, through the year? Sure, Mr. Sahil. Uh, first of all, thank you very much and thank you for joining the call. Uh, with regards to your specific questions, I'd like to, you know, uh, explain to you that, you know, the first quarter is the quarter when generally all our, for, current, for that particular financial year, the new sites that we kind of have identified, they, those will add new seats uh, for the company will get under construction during this uh, period. So these are the sites which we are taking from the landlord on leasehold rights and then obviously we will do a fit out at those sites and then they will come under development. So generally if you see in the first quarter the, the expenses because you know the, all the standard expenses maybe except for the rentals would be on the higher side because the site would not have come for occupation and they will come for occupation during the later half of the year, the later half of the quarter. And then if you look at those seats, they will come for full occupation in the forthcoming quarters. So obviously the seasonality is relating to the way the development cycle happens. So that typically all our development for a particular financial year happens in quarter one and quarter two. Quarter two also, uh, you know, there is a substantial development but then also the benefit in quarter two becomes is that because the quarter one sites, which have become fully live, will become fully available for building during the quarter two. And whatever sites which have come up for you know uh, development during the quarter two, they will be partially available naturally. And this trend will keep increasing in the ongoing quarters, let's say quarter three and quarter four onwards. So I think the uh, it, it's not about the seasonality rather, but it's about the way the development happens in in each uh, uh, each site and the way they come up for uh, occupations and how the building happens to them. So the build up is, build up happens over the over the quarters and accordingly the profitability income everything builds up over the quarters. Please. Uh, understood, sir. So my next question is: I uh, wanted to understand the general receivable cycles for all the segments which is rental design and build and the furniture business what we expect because we could see that the receivables have come down from 120 crore in q4 fi24 to you know 60 crore now around in q4 fi25 and it would be nice to understand the normal receivable cycle and also a request is possible we could share the breakup for the receivables either now or in the next balance sheet update Sure, sure. I mean, uh, with regards to your request for sharing the breakup for receivables for all the different segments, we will definitely take that uh, note and we'll show that as an independent piece of information. Uh, with regards to the, the receivable cycle in general for all three verticals, with regards to the vertical for rental business, the, the receivables are generally less than 30 days because what happens is, uh, you know, we generally receive the receivables in arrear and Maximum of the clients would pay you during the first half of the month, 
and then there are a few clients who will probably come a little later. So, I mean, if you take out average, it is around 15 to 30 days maximum on the rental revenue side. Uh, on account of the design and build uh, division is concerned, design and build division, it runs around average is about 90 days because what happens is, as uh, you know, we have discussed in past that from the date we get a contract and the date we fully execute the contract and the final payment is released to us, that period goes from zero to roughly around 180 days. You know, the day the PO is received, then the designs are approved, then we go into execution. Once the executions are going on, then there are, you know, running bills which are submitted and the running bills which are approved. And then at the end, when the, when the PMC or the client really approves the final work that has been delivered, and then they process the, the balance retention money that they have kind of kept under the contract. Uh, with regards to specifically your question about why the receivables was larger in the uh, financial year ended 31st March 2024, uh, again, uh, the, the, the major reason was that, you know, we have been doing this business for now close to two, two and a half years. And if you receive that, you know, it needs some time for us to establish ourselves in the business, create our own credibility, create our own candidate. So that we are able to sound out large customers like DCS and like Hoport of this world. And earlier years, obviously, we had to, in order to remain relevant in the business, we, we were also taking contracts which were even smaller in size. When I say small, means that, you know, which are around 10,000, 5,000 square feet development. Now I'm in a position that, considering the kind of work that I'm able to kind of attract, I'm in a position to do much better. Uh, you know, contract values where I'm able to do more than 20, 25,000 square feet for contract. So, so what, is, what that means is that I'm then dealing with much more organized players where the cash flows and the fund availability is much more organized than, you know, what it is available with some of the unorganized players. It's not the question of non recoverability it's about just the timing. And that, that kind of had made that recoverability the cycle increased a bit from 90 days to let's say 120 days in the last financial year. But this financial year, there has been great improvement and as you can see in the result, and this trend will generally continue going forward. With regards to the financial division, also it's a little too early to say, but typically there also the receivable will remain between 60 days to 90 days. Quite a bit of business will happen on a institutional level. And uh, that business, when once the business happens with large institutions, uh, you would appreciate that the receivable cycle, they would always prefer a minimum of 60 days, and sometimes they go up to 90 days as well. So that, that's where the entire receivable cycle uh, works for us, uh, Mr. Sai. Uh, understood, sir. Last question from my side. Um, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Sai. Could you please for, come back in the question queue for further questions? Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to answer questions from all participants in the conference room, please limit your questions to two per participant, as there are several participants waiting for their turn. The next question is from the line of Manohar Rao Yadav, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Good morning on the wonderful set of uh, results. Uh, my first question was, sir, I wanted to understand a little bit on the SMREIT side, sir, like now that we would uh, list a subsidiary and the owners would be the unit holders of the REIT. So will the revenue recognition happen on the books of ESC or that revenue would directly go to the unit holders of REIT and, you know, we get the fat and the margins increase? And also, is there any scope of, you know, recognizing the revenue from the furniture and DNB section? Because now the asset would be owned by the unit holders of the small aggregate. Yes, uh, Mr. Manor, thank you so much, and thank you for joining. Uh, with regards to the REIT that you are referring to, uh, first of all, as you know, uh, as you may know, that the SM REIT that we are uh, forming and registering right now with the SEPI, uh, so the, all the assets that will be acquired with the SM REIT, they will be independent and they will not be having any direct link to the assets that the, our company owns. So what will happen is that means that we will be adding new assets to this uh, under the REIT and those new assets
that's what we manage by us as the manager to the read. Uh, since under the SMB, the concept of sponsor and manager has been merged. We, as, a, as, a, as also the sponsor and the manager, we are supposed to contribute 5% of the total requirement uh, of the fund for acquiring those assets that we were acquiring to the SMB. Now, <laughs> out, of, out of the total assets that we have acquired, the revenue would definitely go to the to the SMB and it will be registered under the books in the uh, SMB. But the management fees will come to us, which would obviously somewhere equivalent to the kind of margin that we are making under EFC. Uh, you know, you, you've got to appreciate that obviously since the assets is owned by the REIT, then uh, the assets revenue will also go to the, uh, the REIT. But as far well as we are concerned, we will be and to ensure a complete transparency uh, we didn't want to create a structure where the asset is leased to us and then we manage and then we pay only to the rental to the to the REIT. So the way the structure is created that the entire revenue transparently needs to go to the REIT. As the EFC, from an EFC standpoint, the asset under management will increase because in earlier if I'm managing, let's say right now I'm managing 2.4 million square feet under REIT, let's say we have acquired another 50,000 square feet, another 100,000 square feet that will be added to the overall asset in the management and it will add to my bottom line because the bottom line would remain almost the same for the services that we offer to the REIT. With regards to our dividend from the REIT, it would obviously proportionate to the investment that we make to the REIT, which would be 5% as a company that we are going to meet. Uh, so that, that is how the structure would work with regards to the the DNB division and the financial division, both these divisions can separately and obviously will contribute in development of the assets wherever and whenever so required. Generally, because under the REIT, we will have to take already a rental deal generating asset. That means that those assets would already be furnished and those assets would already be kind of occupied with the right type of furniture. But yes, obviously the asset would require repair, maintenance, asset would require, you know, refurbishments, asset would require replacement of the old and, uh, you know, new age furniture. And that would obviously be provided on a competitive basis by our other divisions to the REIT. I, I guess I have kind of answered your question, Mr. Malor. Yeah, my second and last question, sir, is, uh, when I see the industry, sir, I see most of the competitors uh, working under the managed aggregation model where the landlord is a part of, uh, you know, the occupancy. They get based on the occupancy because they are doing the cap uh, capex. But I see our company very unique here because majority of our properties are on a straight lead model, you know, where we are giving them a fixed rental. So prime face are the managed aggregation looks to be a more you know, a safer model because the downside is protected. So why we as a company have strategically decided to do the straight lease model instead of the managed aggregation model? Yes. Uh, so Mr. Manor, at the outset, I mean, most of the companies typically in our would work on a straight lease model. The revenue share model is not very, you know, something which is prevalent. Yes, there are a few companies which are in the market today and they are obviously working on the you know, on the revenue share model, and we can also work on that model, but we have in past used such models and have faced certain kind of difficulties, which primarily the, you know, the difference of working styles, difference of expectations from the landlord, and giving a very larger share of revenue to the landlord in compared to the amount of risk that we are taking. You've got to appreciate, Mr. Manor, that, you know, let us say, even if I'm doing under a managed aggregation model, I am supposed to commit contractually to the landlord, number one. I am supposed to commit a minimum fees to the landlord, minimum guarantee amount to the landlord. So what difference I'm making is that a bit of delta, which is, let's say, hypothetically, I'm giving an example to you, that let's say a particular property is going to cost you 100 rupees a rental under the managed allegation, you might be in a position to commit let's say 60, 70 rupees as a minimum guarantee and balance 30, 35 rupees as an upside which would come later. And that 30, 35 rupees would not be the fixed amount. It would be as a percentage of your, share, your revenue or your profitability. That would make the actual cost of your property 
going up from 100 to 125. Because naturally, a landlord with whom you are sharing the risk, and now he is bearing the risk, he is not going to give you at the same price at which he would have otherwise given on a straight lease. So it is a two-edged sword. If we don't have confidence on the market, we don't understand the market, we don't understand the micro market where we perform or where we operate, then it is better that we go for revenue share and even account for this little bit of risk that we are taking. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you are even doing an NG, you are even doing a contractual commitment to the landlord. You know, it is not a case that one fine day, you can just simply say to the landlord that, okay, fine, sorry, I'm not able to fill the place and I'm leaving, you know. So, I mean, if you look at the, look at the commercials, you look at the contractual terms, in our opinion, yes, one can argue that there is a minimum guarantee, but there is a delta, which is, you know, we are covering by way of revenue share. But then on the other hand, I would definitely like to, you know, bring it out to them that that delta is hurting well to the company because then it is taking away your margin. Because if you if your cost increases substantially on the rental side because of the managed aggregation model and the profit sharing model, then your profitability at the bottom would certainly severely get hit because there is no other place for doing the efficiency building. And, and operation efficiency would be totally in two, three ways where, you know, we, you can control those costs. So I think that is what one has to appreciate. And we are confident of this model. We have been working with this model for more than 10 years now. We've been, uh, you know, our sales teams and our marketing team is strong enough to be able to maintain an average occupancy of around 90%. And we strongly believe that we only take or add as much seats or properties that we feel that we will be able to continue to occupy them and sell them with a 90% plus occupancy. And lastly, most importantly, as you know, that more than 65 to 70% of the business is with big corporates, large corporates, which kind of are committed for a longer duration so that my risk, which is, which I'm, 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 I'm you know, exposing myself with the landlord is getting equally, you know, taken care, taken care by these large contracts where I have five-year contract with three-year lockings and four-year lockings. Uh, I, I hope I'm trying to kind of yeah. explain. Thank you, better. sir, and uh, again, congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Yash from Stalin Nasset. Please go ahead. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the property. Um, I just wanted to understand, so I think in your balance sheet, you've got 247 crores of loans for first half, and uh, you know, in your current assets, I just wanted to see, uh, understand what is that. Yeah, so the loans is uh, primarily that we have taken to acquire the property that has been acquired by the company. So we have taken uh, lease rental discounting uh, facilities and the terminal facilities from the bank to acquire the properties. Uh, so what has happened is that, what, what this means is that right now, let's say if I'm paying a rental to the, when we see an opportunity where the, the EMIs become equivalent to the amount of rent which I'm paying, uh, plus minus here and there a bit, then we try to kind of acquire those property on our books through a lease rental discounting. Because what happens is that at least here, if I keep paying the rental, I'm not building an asset. Here, by paying the EMI, instead of paying the rental, I'm at least building an asset on my book. That makes our companies, the balance sheet stronger. That makes our companies the ability to, you know, withstand any, you know, downside stronger. Because, you know, when you own those centers yourself, your ability to manage them and your ability to kind of stand in the, in the difficult times becomes much better. So those loans are primarily towards the, you know, we have, we as we, you may know that there are four floors that we own at Marisol IT Park in Pune, uh, and then there is, which is about 100,000 square feet, and then we have acquired for 80,000 square feet at Vakrivari Pune recently, uh, as you, as we have announced in past, as so all these 180,000 square feet has been acquired, so this, under this lease rental discounting model, and that is, largely the loan that is which is there on the books of the company got it got it and uh, i think the last call we have mentioned that you know our guidance is 350 crores not of 350 crores for the year uh, so do you would like to so revise the guidance given the strong performance that we've got in first half uh, 
350 crores uh, on account of the rental you are talking or on account of uh, uh, the overall uh, performance you were referring to? No, I, I think this was for the rental, but you, you can tell me if you have any uh, plans for the overall, uh, including both the businesses. No, I think the, the business is doing really good and the way the trends are, uh, and it has been in the past also, that quarter and quarter, uh, you know, the business is really performing uh, and the order books are on hand for uh, both the divisions, uh, the, the DNB and on the, on the furniture division. And on the rental division, as you know, it's pretty linear, so the business is doing well with the seats getting added, seats coming up for occupancy. The business is growing and it will continue to grow in a similar fashion. Uh, I mean, in terms of guide, guidance, yes, we we do stand by, uh, you know, that uh, we will be able to achieve around 70,000 seats by end of this year. And, uh, you know, uh, we will be able to achieve uh, at least, if not more, 100%, uh, you know, improvement in our, uh, you know, performance in the, in the vital division as well. And uh, naturally, in the, in the furniture manufacturing business, this is the first year. So we are certainly looking forward that we, you know, look, I mean, we kind of capitalize and really build the, you know, the business, the way the factory looked in back then, in that if you look at the factory, the way it is built and the way the entire infrastructure has come up, we are really uh, hoping that it will deliver whatever all of our expectations have been over the years. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vineet from Chris PMS. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, Mr. Vineet. Uh, sir, my question is with respect to the guidance. Like uh, just now, you told that by uh, you will be reaching seventy thousand seats by the end of this year, right? Uh, in the Q in the Q two, you are adding three thousand seats. So. How are we planning in the next half of the year? Like, uh, will we be adding 20,000 seats? No, no. So, 3,000 seats is uh, adding in the capacity this uh, financial year, uh, this quarter. And it is also going to get better because, you know, there are certain properties which are already been identified and one, of one large property which is, you know, one single property which is identified and which will come up for uh, fit out in the third quarter. Is uh, it is going to have uh, more than 5,600 seats in a single center. So we have, uh, you know, a couple of such centers already identified. We have already reserved and booked, which is coming up for fit out. So we will certainly be able to be already at the visibility, and that is how we are talking that we will reach about 65 to 70,000 seats by the end of the year. Uh, obviously, all the 70,000 seats would not come up for occupation. Uh, during the third and fourth quarter, they would come over the period. But what we are taking a guidance is that by end of this financial year, as on 31st March 2025, we are expecting to touch this mark of anything between 65 to 70,000 seats. Uh, and that's the guidance that we are uh, still uh, committed and stand by right now. Okay, okay, sounds great. Uh, my another question is with, with respect to the segment wise economics. Like, can you explain me? Uh, economics uh, in individual segments and also for the furniture segment can you tell me if we have any order book pipeline or um, how are we looking like it's, it's been one month right one and a half month since it has got operational so correct, correct. yeah yes, it's been a lot of months now and uh, it, and then the commercial production has started and obviously the things are picking up uh, you know the team has really uh, worked very hard to kind of uh, you know, deliver the first order within the first quarter itself. And then they are also in the process of, uh, you know, building up their order book uh, into different uh, business verticals that we are working on. Uh, and the order book is certainly looking pretty promising. And uh, we are, as we have earlier mentioned, that are targeting that we could achieve anything. I mean, the, the estimates and the projections that the same things are given is that we, we would definitely achieve anything around, you know, 60 to 75 uh, crores of revenue uh, for the, you know, the furniture division. With regards to the margin that you're talking for the segments, both the rental and the uh, and the and the DNB division, uh, we have discussed in past that the rental division typically on a central level 
we have a margin of about three percent, and on a on a uh, on a on a on a, on a uh, corporate level, it is about twenty five percent. While in terms of the DNP division, average margins comes around seventeen eighty percent. But some, you know, the the division or the contracts where we have you know a lot of uh, you know difficult work to be carried out, like say. Uh, where we are doing a contract for laboratories or research centers or you know any other contracts that are developing office infrastructure, which is pretty competitive, the margins improve significantly, which is more than you know around 24, 25 percent. Uh, I mean, this I'm talking obviously the average numbers, uh, and uh, that's what the broad margins are for both these uh, verticals. Uh, Chris. Okay. Okay. Uh, and with respect to the outlook that you shared, like 100% growth in DNB segment, uh, and what was your guidance with respect to this uh, rental segment? So rental segment, as I have explained, uh, sir, that we are expecting anything about 65 to 70 thousand seats. We would uh, certainly maintain our seat rate at 6250 uh, minimum uh, per seat. And uh, you know, right now, as you know, that we already have 50,000 seats. So you are talking about 50,000 seats as already available for occupation for the entire next half uh, at this rate. And the balance, another about 15 to 20,000 seats, which will get built up over the next six months' time. So on an average, let's say they would come for occupancy at about anything between 40% or so of the total seats. Because on an average, because they will they will come up for occupancy over a period, right, over the next six months. So that that would be the the broad number of seats that would get achieved, and the the rate that we are talking about is about we will certainly maintain uh, at least six two five zero per uh, seat, and uh, going forward the rates would increase because now on uh, the average rates per seat for the new seats getting added are in on an increasing trend. So yeah, that's the broad guidelines, uh, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you for answering. Welcome. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahil Shah from Crown Capital. Please go ahead. Mm, uh, hi, sir. Good morning. Uh, sorry to press you again on this guidance thing, but I believe in the last quarter uh, you had said that you will look into you know double your revenues uh, in FY25. Um, so is it still intact like for, for the company overall? And in quarter one, your margins dipped quite a lot to 45%, which you've improved to 50% in quarter two. But you've also done around 55 to 56% uh, in one of the last year quarters. So can we expect the same going ahead as well? Uh, you know, in terms of target, uh, yes. I mean, obviously, we are trying, pushing our best, and, you know, we are trying to achieve uh, the targets which are set. Uh, you know, as you can appreciate and understand that under the DNP and the furniture sector, uh, not that 100% is in our control that we'll be able to kind of uh, replicate or achieve whatever has been set targeted for. But yes, we can only commit to you about you know what order books on the hand, and we believe that with the order books on hand on every quarter, uh, we would certainly be able to achieve very good results for for the DNP sector. And also, similarly, since the furniture sector has now become full-fledged operational for that sector as well, with regards to the rental, uh, uh, it is pretty linear, as I have explained uh, in my you know previous discussions. And uh, you know, going forward, you can certainly at least expect a full revenue for 50,000 seats, and obviously partial revenue for the the new 15 to 20,000 seats which are getting added. Uh, we are very aggressive. We are really working hard on the targets and hoping to achieve what has been set at the beginning of the year, sir. <laughs> okay, and manufacturing the trading of furniture, uh, uh, how much is the, what percentage is it, part of the revenue mix? So as of now, it is insignificant, as I said, because it started uh, just on 28th September. But, uh, you know, by end of this year, I believe it would certainly be around, uh, at least if not more, but around 15% or so. Uh, and uh, year on year, it will definitely get improved. And the target is that it will at least all the three division would at least do an equal business of 33% each. You know, but this financial year, I I presume 
uh, you know, based on the target and the estimates. Uh, the furniture division, manufacturing division would, would contribute around the 15% to the total turnover. Okay. And lastly, the average uh, rate per seat is uh, what right now? And you were saying that you see a trend of increasing. So uh, by what percentage you expect it to be at the end of the year? So, so if we are seeing the trend in the new centers that we are adding, the average rates are increasing beyond and around 6,500 per square feet. But uh, you know, if you if you look at the uh, if you look at the average overall uh, rate, it is uh, remaining around 6,250 because you understand that the previous seats which have been added uh, were sold in in and around this rate, so the average still remains around 6,250. But with the new seats getting added more and more, and they are getting sold at a higher rate of 6,500 upwards, we will be able to, you know, you know, improve the uh, improve the seat rates hopefully by at least when you take out the average by end of this year. Okay, okay, got it, sir. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankur Kumar from Alpha Capital. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, thank you for taking the question. Sir, I actually started following this company recently. I wanted to understand about the margin guidance and for this year, as in Q1 was a little softer on margin side and Q2 has bounced back. How should we look at second half for this year? And sir, next year also, if you can please comment. So, you know, as we have always maintained, sir, the quarter on quarter, the margins you will so see different primarily because the building up of the seats and the, and the building up of the, you know, margins on the business that we achieve on the other divisions like the DNB divisions and the furniture division. You know, once the seats are getting built up, obviously, and once all those seats are getting coming for occupancy, the revenue and the, re and the better occupancy <laughs> Better occupancy rate would give you better margins naturally. So there is an incremental rate, which will obviously average out around, as I explained to you, on an annualized basis, at anything about 30% on the central level and 25% on the corporate level. But that's the kind of margins that one can really estimate, and that's what our targets are always that we estimate for a particular center, keeping in mind the day they come for occupancy. And from the and from that day to the if you can cancel it on an annualized basis, then that's the kind of margin that you kind of you know work around. As I've explained to you in the, in my previous questions, that this betterment in the margin largely happens because the more seats have come for billing purpose, more seats have come for occupancy purpose for the entire quarter. You know, even if they come for billing purpose for let's say only one month of the entire quarter, it doesn't make too much of a significant difference in the margin. But when the seeds come, so obviously all the seeds which have developed in the previous quarter, which is which is operational in the previous quarter, will come for full billing for the entire for the upcoming quarter. So naturally, the upcoming quarter's results will go to get better and better than the previous quarters from the rental revenue perspective. But overall margin, as I've explained, if you look at it on an annualized basis. That's the kind of uh, you know uh, estimates, and that's the kind of margins that we at least make our sales teams and our operational team to work at, which is about 30% on, on a on a on a central level and about 25% on a corporate level. Uh, sorry, sir, but last year and uh, in this second, first and second quarter, are not the margins like 40, 45 percent reach? So as I said, for a particular quarter, there will be such kind of a situation. If you annualize the profitability for the last year, the average annual profit for the last year was 15 net profit, I'm saying, not the EBITDA level after taking case of interest, tax, depreciation, everything. The net profit was around 15.76% or around 15%, I mean, roughly broadly. So I think that is the kind of margin that you generally estimate from you know, our businesses on a combined level because, you know, we were offered through this three different verticals. Uh, so, I mean, so, like I said, the annualized margin will remain around this while on a quarter to quarter, there will be obviously difference in the margin depending upon the seats which have come up for occupancy, seats which have come up for billing. Got it, sir. So you are saying about net profit margins and not EBITDA margins. 
Yeah, so earlier what I explained to you is not in EBITDA margins. The net profit margins remain around, let's say, 17, 18%. Uh, depending on on a rental business side, on an average, if you look at on a on a consolidated basis, it remains around fifteen to sixteen percent. Got it. Thank you, and all the best. Welcome, please. The next question is from the line of Shreyan Jain from Electrum Capital. Please go ahead. Hello, am I audible? Yes, please. Yeah, congratulations on a great set of numbers, sir. I have Thank three you. questions. Uh, first one is regarding our design and build out division team and the status of the merger that is pending and what was the basis of the valuation of the 545 crores. So the merger status is that it is pending for an NOC from the SEBI as of now. Uh, we are expecting, you know, I mean, based on the discussions happened, there are no more clarifications, I guess, which is required. All the, the information clarifications on the scheme have been submitted well. Uh, I mean, we are just following up uh, very aggressively and, you know, rigorously and expecting any time soon. Uh, with regards to the valuation, uh, at that point of time, obviously, the valuation was derived based on the contracts in hand, based on the business inside and based on the projections that were created at that point of time, which were written by uh, the registered valuer, a merchant banker. So we take in two reports, one from a merchant banker and one from a registered valuer, and those reports were used as a base for creating the valuation for uh, both the respective companies and arrive at the swap ratio. Okay, and what is your team size in the DNB division? The team size in the division uh, is, is more than 40 people, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and then that includes your architects, that includes your designers, and also includes your sales teams, uh, part of it. Okay, got it, sir. And uh, second question regarding eight design, half on the division. Why have you only invested 76 percent, and the investment of 25 crores that was said, I think, somewhere. Uh, who did that and who owns the remaining 24%? So, as of now, uh, you know, the white eight design uh, was an existing company, which was uh, owned by uh, young entrepreneurs uh, who were already doing this, uh, you know, furniture manufacturing business. They have an engineering background and they've been doing very well in their business, particularly on the residential side and on the, uh, on the uh, hospitality sector side. And, uh, you know, once we saw the opportunity, because, you know, we use them to source some of our, uh, you know, furniture for our office uh, infrastructure requirement. And we saw the kind of margins that they were able to, you know, generate. And we saw the kind of quality that they were able to generate and the timeline they were able to convert uh, the delivery to. So we have acquired 76% from them. And uh, the, the, the initial capital which was invested was 5 crore rupees in the business. Uh, there was no secondary sale. This was a primary investment which we made into the company to enhance their existing capacity. So they were operating mm -hmm. through a small uh, mm -hmm. manufacturing mm -hmm. setup. Mm -hmm. That manufacturing setup was enhanced now mm -hmm. to the three-acre land, three-acre area that uh, we are now present at Fusungi. And, uh, you know, that 76% is acquired. Accordingly, the balance is owned by them and the other stakeholders. And uh, with regards to the investment, the total investment, including also the working capital, was then researched uh, at about 25 crore. Uh, but the capex, which was invested, is in about 5 to 6 crore. Uh, that has been invested by EFC India Limited, the major shareholder of the company. Got it. Thank you so much, sir. All the best for future quarters. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question is from the line of Krishna Shah from Ashika Stock Broking. Please go ahead. Oh, firstly, Mr. Nikhil, congratulations on a great set of numbers. Uh, so I just wanted to understand the market uh, at this point. What is the kind of competition? What are the kind of players that you're facing uh, uh, currently in the geography that you're present? I think that the managed office is a co-working business is... is uh, you know, is getting crowded as you may can see now also. 
And with regards to the competition, yes, everybody has to create their own position in the market. Everybody has to create their own niche in the market. And we are able to create one for us in a few years' time. And, uh, and, you know, sorry, so there is some disturbance. Yeah, I think at the uh, moderator level, please uh, take care of that. Uh, yeah, so I was trying to say that in terms of competition, yes, the market is crowded, uh, but the significant players are limited, as you could know that the players who are in their present players who offer services across uh, the major cities of the country are pretty limited. There are a lot of regional players. And obviously, they offer a lot of competition when it comes to the sales. But as we have explained in past, that you know our MD's vision is very clear that we need to create a larger catchment area. We need to work and operate at an efficiency where we are able to cater to the largest customer base that we can, and that makes us in a position where we are able to kind of sustain the kind of occupancy that we are, you know, referring to, which is an average occupancy of 90%. So, you know, our, our MD is very clear that, you know, at the end of the day, you are offering an office infrastructure to somebody as a solution. You are, you are taking care of those assets on behalf of the businessman enterprises, and we have to make it reasonable. We have to make it quality conscious, and we have to offer them the best, Set of uh, combinations that we can offer on the pricing and on the quality, and that's what we've been trying to do for all the years, and that's where we keep working towards. And I think all these integrations are going to help us in a great way, and that kind of puts us a little differently than the competition, because as in the market, probably we are one of the, or maybe I can say proudly that we are the only one who is that integrated model. So I think competition is there; it will remain. There is no business which will remain uh, devoid of competition, but one has to create their own positioning, and that's what we are trying to achieve. Oh, got it, sir. Got it. My second question is in terms of the average area per side that we seeing has increased from twenty-five to thirty thousand uh, per square uh, square feet uh, in the last quarter to thirty-five and forty thousand in this quarter. So, does this mean that we are acquiring larger office spaces? And how does that affect our uh, uh, occupancy levels? Given we are looking at ninety percent, so do we see any challenges in terms of you know leasing these out, uh, the larger spaces? Absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, you know, there are obviously benefits in acquiring the larger is the economy of scale that we are able to achieve. Uh, you know, uh, we are yes uh, acquiring or rather acquiring lease or rights over the larger area. Uh, you know, there are a couple of reasons to it, if I can break it down. One is that, you know, we are now established in all those big cities very well. So we understand the micro markets of each, this, each of the cities very well. And so our, our confidence of selling or filling those spaces in those micro markets in those cities have gone up significantly. Our sales teams understand the psyche of that business, psyche of that market, and, you know, you know the... the the, the broker network that has been created, the, the you know the, the marketing network that has been created. So we are now able to make use of getting a larger space, get better economy in your sourcing the property because if you source a larger space, obviously your ability to negotiate is better. Your ability to you know kind of fit out, carry out the fit out at the best price becomes better. So that kind of helps you in doing a lot of efficiency building. On the other end, with your question about our ability to fill and our ability to maintain the occupancy. So like I explained, and since we understand this market now very well, with our presence there for a significant period of around, you know, almost each city for more than five years, we are able to understand the market pretty well and we are only, you know, kind of getting ourselves properties where to micro markets which are doing very good and are likely to do good for the next, you know, three to five years. So, you know, as you can appreciate in each city, the micro markets also keep shifting. But, you know, that is an estimate and that's the kind of, uh, you know, business calls that every, you know, player in our business will have to keep to understand that where the market is going to get, uh, you know, saturated or melt, get rather set, uh, uh, you know, focused in, uh, out of the entire city. So I 
Sorry to interrupt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, that was the last question for today's conference call. I now hand the, hand the conference over to Mr. Nikhil Bhuta, whole time director of EFC India Limited, for their closing comments. First of all, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining this early morning call, and we are really thankful for all of you to your, you know, lot of continued support. Uh, you know, we appreciate that your engagement with us uh, is, is, is really helping us to and encouraging us to do much better and better every quarter. As we move forward, we remain committed to driving growth and delivering value to all our shareholders. Should you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and have a great uh, weekend and a great Diwali week coming, uh, you know, coming week. And, um, you know, and, and, and lots of good wishes and good health to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of EFC India Limited, that concludes today's session. If there are any questions that have remained unanswered due to paucity of time, request you to kindly send us the same to compliance at the rate efclimited.in. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect the call. Thank you.